My name is Zara Snap. Uh, my organization is Instituto Ria. We're based here in Mexico. Um, we do research and advocacy work on drug policy, and we do it with a development perspective um, in the sense of understanding that as a country that cultivates plants and psychoactive substances, we must view this issue within development and cultivation and sustainable livelihoods uh, in order to really have uh, the, the great, the social impact that we would hope uh, legal regulation could have in Mexico and in other countries, obviously. Um, I think it's important just to note that uh, in many, well, first I'll, I'll do the housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded, just so you all know, so then we can be sharing it. Um, uh, please feel free to use the chat box to engage. I see that many of you have already introduced yourself. It's been wonderful to see you all. Um, and use the Q&A box at the bottom to put in questions that you'd like our panelists to answer after they've done their opening presentation. So we'll be opening up to, to those kinds of questions. Um, and uh, if you are tweeting this event, feel free to tweet uh, with a world with drugs is our hashtag that we'll be using for these, um, for these, for these webinars. You know, as we know, this is, it's difficult. We would all like to be together. We would all like to be meeting um, in person, but these are the times that we're living in right now. And so, although we are all in different countries and um, in different spaces, we can still meet and, and have this conversation. And so feel free to use Zoom as much as we can um, to, to have that engagement and to, in a way, I, I, I sometimes think that these, these online forums are, are more exciting because you can be talking and commenting on what's being said in the moment. And so feel free to do so if you um, agree or if you have questions, you know, just feel free to, free to engage. Um, and when you send to the chat box, make sure that you put panelists and attendees so that everyone can see um, instead of just the panelists, since we'll be wanting to, it's, it's good to have this, this um, uh, feedback on the different questions. And we will also be creating a summary report after each webinar. So feel free to feed in here because this is a way for us to collate and to bring together uh, these comments, which will then allow us to, to have a more rich report and, and, and a more collaborative experience. So this series of webinars is hosted by Health Poverty Action in collaboration with seven other organizations. Uh, the International Drug Policy Consortium, Transform Drug Policy Foundation, the Transnational Institute, the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition, Instituto Ria, the Interdisciplinary Center for Cannabis Research, and the Legal Regulation Project. And so this is one of, of eight, uh, eight webinars that we'll be doing at the end. We'll, we'll share with you the others but you're very welcome to, to be part of all of these as this is, uh, the, the goal is that this can be an ongoing uh, exercise and dialogue that we can have. Um, so that we will be having short uh, introductions, well, short presentations from each of our speakers, and then we will uh, open up to, uh, we'll open up to the, to, to questions and answers. So our speakers today are Helen Clark from the Global Commission on Drug, policy, Filasande Malakata from, and I'm going to do my best on these, Umzibubu Farmers, Umzibubu, yeah, okay, Farmers Support Network, uh, Duncan Green from LSE and Oxfam, and Anne Fordham, who's the director of the International Drug Policy Consortium. So we began thinking and working on these uh, webinars because we strongly believe that development is currently being undermined by the war on drugs and by prohibitionist policies. This approach of prohibition has been a driving force for global inequality and poverty for over 60 years. And if you go back to the first international drug control uh, conventions since 1912 or 1909 was the first meeting. So now that we're in the current reality and we have the sustainable development goals, for example, that we have, uh, that all member states have, have, have said they will, they will work to achieve, um, we recognize that it is vital to address current drug policy and the harms being caused by prohibition in order to achieve the SDGs and sustainable development. 
we've also noticed, and this is something that um, is for those of us who, who are working in the drug policy field, we are not development experts. We do not have that experience. And so we seek to engage uh, the development sector through these webinars and in other spaces as well in order to learn and be able to exchange the lessons that we will need in order to really take this to another level and to be able to really um, integrate development and drug policy reform in, in a more cohesive sense. So we've noticed that there's been an absence of this collaborative thinking and direct action by both sectors. And it's meant that many people are kept in a cycle of marginalization, poverty, and inequality. But things are changing. Legal regulation is happening in, in many jurisdictions. Uruguay was the first country. Now there are 11 states in the United States which have uh, legal adult use cannabis markets. Canada has regulated. Mexico would need to pass a law according to the Supreme Court by December 15th for adult use of cannabis. And so we're moving in these directions and it provides an opportunity for development to play a leading role. It's not without that perspective of development, without human rights, public health, decriminalization and harm reduction at the heart of this new legislation, the trade-off of commercial legal markets could be worse or more harmful than under prohibition. And so that's why it's important that we begin to have this conversation uh, when we are in this very important uh, political and social moment. Um, academic and activist spaces have focused oftentimes more on demand, on, on decriminalization, but use and cultivation are about people. It's about sustainable livelihoods. It's about uh, making the best choices for your family and for your community. So if we see this from a cultivation and producing country perspective, decrim decriminalization maybe is not enough because legal regulation looks at the entire production chain and it takes into account uh, those cultivating communities. For us, it could look at cooperatives, it can look at fair trade or social justice criteria. And for me, legal regulation, especially in Mexico, is not about replacing currently illegal markets, but it's about transitioning those who have participated in the illegal market and in that way been isolated or marginalized, transitioning those communities, and many of them want to, they tell us every day, into a legal space where they have rights, where they can fully take advantage of the economic revenues that might be gained from legal regulation. So that's why it's very important that we're having this, this conversation now. We believe this is a time for action. This is a call to action to all of you who are forming part of this webinar now. In this series, we're gonna be talking about people's livelihoods, millions of people working in the drugs trade and impacted by the war on drugs. This is not a fringe issue. And we see that there are many commercial interests that don't see it as a fringe issue. And so we need to ensure that all of our voices and all of our energy is also ensuring that social justice is put at the center so that it is not left to the corporations to decide. We believe this is an issue of utmost importance for the development sector and we need to integrate it into the agenda. Throughout this series, we aim to create a space for learning, for being bold and creative. That's where we need all of you to share expertise and to join advocacy forces so we can address this injustice and the harms together. This is our opportunity. So thank you very much for joining all of us today. And we look forward to spending time together over the next few months in this webinar series. We're gonna begin with our first speaker, Helen Clark. This is possibly Helen's first public event as the new chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. The Global Commission has been working on this issue since 2011 and previously with the Latin American Commission. And in 2014, they published an important report, the Red Report on legal regulation. Since then, they have worked tirelessly to push forward this vision, understanding that it is a development and human rights issue. Helen Clark was the head of the United Nations Development Program during the United Nations General Assembly Special Session on Drugs in 2016. And we witnessed UNDP taking on this issue in a very integrated manner, share, writing reports and really doing their best to be part of the discussion at the, at the multilateral level. So we wanna thank Helen 
for being a champion of this issue, no matter where you are playing this role. And, um, and we're very grateful that she sent along uh, this talk for us to hear. Thank you. Many thanks for inviting me to contribute to this event on exploring the legal regulation of drugs through a development lens. My thanks go to civil society organizations for coming together to frame the discussion on the legal regulation of drugs and for ensuring that rights are placed at the front and center of drug policy reform. Drug policy settings do have a profound impact on whether societies can achieve sustainable development. Following a prohibitionist approach to drugs leaves so many people and communities behind. People who use drugs are then stigmatized and, and repressed in such settings. Attempts to pursue a war on drugs have led to rising homicide rates, over-incarceration, forced displacement, and further marginalization of impacted communities. These attempts have also fostered corruption and bad governance. A whole range of the sustainable development goals from poverty to reducing inequalities and improving governance in the rule of law just cannot be achieved in such circumstances. The international political declarations which guide global drug policy and control are frankly not in touch with reality and they don't take into account the multidisciplinary nature and impacts of drug policy. In Vienna, member states meeting at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs operate in a law and order silo, as if their decisions do not affect global development strategies, but they do. For example, they commit to eradicating illicit crops with so little regard for the socioeconomic dependence of traditional marginalized farmers on these crops. They commit to lifting the restrictions on essential controlled medicines, while at the same time making no changes to the scheduling and import export system, thus in effect, ignoring the reality that 75% of the world's population has no access to pain relief. They adopt declarations calling for the elimination of drug use, knowing that attempts to operationalize those calls have claimed so many lives through harsh and aggressive policies from those implemented by state organizations all the way to the extrajudicial killings with an official blind eye turned in some countries. The reality is that the current dominant policy approaches have created harms which cannot and should not be ignored because of the very broad adverse impacts they have on human and sustainable development. Take, for example, the impacts on efforts to eliminate HIV AIDS as a global health threat. We just cannot reach the last mile of that quest while people who inject drugs are discriminated against, repressed, and denied access to appropriate services. The impact of drug policies on the transmission of hepatitis and tuberculosis is also profound. Then we see our prisons filled with people who have been incarcerated for minor drug-related offenses. There are serious human rights violations occurring during the arrests of people who use drugs and of those involved in the illegal market. But the irony is that these policy settings have had no impact whatsoever in achieving the stated aim of member states of reducing the global illegal market. The multilateral system has approached drugs as a politically charged standalone issue. It has lost sight of the broader context of other criminal threats and not recognized that criminal organizations in all markets are facilitated by common factors, corruption, lack of financial transparency, state capacity and legitimacy, and by criminal groups operating in multiple illegal markets at once. Similarly, the multilateral system has neglected what it has for years referred to now as the unintended consequences of the drug control regime. One does wonder what member states really thought might happen as a result of the policies they've endorsed. 
Theoretically, the implementation of the sustainable development goals should allow for more integrated and comprehensive approaches to the complex challenges of devising enlightened drug policies. Yes, substance use and substance use disorders do create a significant public health burden. And Sustainable Development Goal 3 is right to place alcohol and illegal drugs in its same target. But what makes the latter, the illegal drugs, more harmful is actually the way in which people are forced to consume. So often, in a prohibitionist setting, they must do so in hidden venues, under unsafe consumption patterns, often encountering fake products, in a climate of daily harassment from authorities and from dealers. They are marginalized and they may be pushed into procurement crimes. What we've seen in the so-called war on drugs is a focus on fighting drugs as substances and trying to have them eradicated. That is futile. A public approach rather than a criminalized one would lead instead to a focus on individuals' vulnerabilities rather than on the substances they are using. The implementation of the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development does provide a serious pathway to a better world for all. But those implementing this bold Sustainable Development Agenda must recognize that a drug-free world cannot and will not be achieved, that drug-related health issues and social unrest are fueled by current prohibitive laws and policies, and that the war on drugs has resulted in weak and ineffective public institutions in so many places. The Global Commission on Drug Policy has been calling for years for the prioritization of public health in the design and implementation of drug policies. We do believe that since UNGAS 2016, our call has been heard and that the health sector is taking its rightful place in this debate. And we call on countries to implement that health and rights-based approach now. Drug policy reform is happening in a number of jurisdictions, driven by the recognition that the criminalization of drug use threatens public health, fuels over-incarceration and triggers violence. Some jurisdictions have moved away from incarcerating people who use drugs, albeit in some cases imperfectly, by replacing arrests and convictions with fines and warnings. For the record, for the Global Commission on Drug Policy, we see no justification for any punishment for drug use, whether it be civil, administrative, or criminal punishment. Criminalization carries with it many harms and brings no benefits. The legal regulation of drugs as an option is no longer on the fringes of public policy and debate. An increasing number of countries are now taking steps in that direction, for now with a focus on cannabis primarily. This is a clear and irreversible trend. In parallel, we're already seeing the corporatization of these emerging markets. And policymakers need to match that corporate speed and confidence with a creative and visionary framework which will work to reduce inequality and poverty and not perpetuate it. Central to that is finding ways to make sure that those whose livelihoods are dependent on the illegal drug trade can be supported to transition into the legal markets and to give them the confidence that hard-fought drug policy reforms will make their lives better, not worse. At the Global Commission on Drug Policy, we welcome this webinar series as a very important contribution to the discussion on how the legal regulation of drugs should proceed. We encourage those in the development sector and in the wider audience for drug policy to participate actively in the debate. We see this as a rare and positive opportunity to help shape regulation 
which can advance equity, justice, and human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much to Helen. Um, just as she says, I think prohibition forces people to consume in risky conditions. It's important to highlight also that it forces people and communities to cultivate under very risky conditions and um, with uh, interactions with non-state actors that might not always have positive outcomes. And so this is really what we want to get into today. Um, we're very excited uh, to hear next from um, Pilar Sande. Uh, sorry, I have to say your name with a Spanish accent. <laughs> um, who's going to be, she is the project coordinator of the Umzimbubu Farmers Network in South Africa. And she's going to be speaking to us from the perspective of growers and farmers in South Africa. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, thank you, Helen, for that uh, profound presentation. And I am Pilasande Mashakata from uh, Umzimbubu Farmers Support Network. I speak representing uh, rural farmers who cultivate cannabis, who have been cultivating cannabis um, along with several other rural settlements in South Africa uh, who have been relying on cultivating cannabis to make money um, as well as supplying the underground markets that have been thriving for as, as far back as uh, cannabis trading can go. Um, most of these families who do cultivate cannabis in um, Bondoland, in Limpopo, in KwaZulu-Natal, they do so for the aim of making money rather than for personal consumption. They do use uh, cannabis for traditional remedies, both for humans and for animals. Um, but the core of it is making money for them. Unfortunately, they have been practicing this illicitly underground simply because of prohibitions that come a very long way from over 100 years ago, which have proven to hinder the progress of um, these families in terms of being completely dependent and uh, self-reliant. And the war on drugs introduction in South Africa has proven to be quite brutal and especially for these rural um, uh, small-scale farmers of cannabis as uh, it was uh, uh, imposed onto these communities via aerial spraying which would uh, be done by the South African police for many years and um, which we stepped in. This is how Umzim Vobo Pharma Support Network has come to exist. It came to exist mainly as a reaction to the spraying of these um, fields. We have assisted the communities in terms of uh, launching a litigation campaign against the South African police. And we are at a point now in South Africa where the government and everybody else that is involved in the development of cannabis can actually play a role in changing the, the situation, in changing the way that things have been done. If government is really serious about making this a meaningful industry, as they say, for these rural farmers, they do acknowledge that they are seeing them. They know that they've been incarcerated. They know that they've been serving time in jail. They've been brutalized by police. They have been experiencing all kinds of actions. And if they are actually serious, this is the time to do so now by meaningfully engaging these communities. And so far, since the, the passing of the privacy rule in, uh, in, in, in 2018, September, where uh, the Constitutional Court allowed for individuals in South Africa to cultivate, to possess, and to use cannabis as they see fit, um, this has come as a really uh, light at the end of the tunnel, but it still speaks to a very small amount of South Africans as it only opens up for people who 
have had the interest to grow for themselves. But as you can imagine, there's over 20 million users of cannabis in South Africa, and not all of them have the time or the expertise to cultivate, nor do they have the interest. And more so, a lot of them don't even have the space to do so because we live in different settings. Some live in rural areas, some in urban areas, and some in informal settlements where there's very little land to none for cultivating. And this uh, needs to change. Um, the privacy ruling needs to engage more, needs to reach out more to communities, find out how they have been using, how um, it has thrived for so long, this industry, because it has thrived underground. There's never been a time when there hasn't been cannabis cultivation, where there hasn't been all of this trouble that has come about from people cultivating. So that needs to be looked at uh, in the terms of indigenous knowledge, and it needs to be acknowledged. And before the Justice Ministry and everybody else in government that is responsible for shaping the, the, the legal framework of how to use cannabis in South Africa um, can, and can engage with communities rather than imposing rules and regulations that they don't know how will work. It feels like um, the, the passing of the, of, the, of the ruling that came in 2018, it feels more like uh, ticking the boxes such as this new cannabis bill that has been introduced. Uh, it hasn't uh, been passed as a law just as yet. It has been um, introduced and it has been um, making its rounds. And um, now the unfortunate part is that for this as well, um, it hasn't made its way to the people who are most relevant to the situation of cannabis farming. It has made its way to people who have access to internet, to who are able to read and write Meanwhile, a lot of uh, people living in these homes that you see in these pictures um, do not have uh, network coverage for their cell phones, for television. They don't have access to news and they don't even know there is so much uproar throughout the country regarding the use of cannabis. They know nothing about the bill and the bill is very serious because if it were to come um, into a law, then it would mean that the rural communities of Mpondaland and everywhere else in South Africa will forever be criminalized. They will never ever have a space whereby they can commercialize, where they can fit into this industry, whereby everybody else is benefiting. And we find it really um, unfair that such laws can be passed without actually interacting with the people that are going to be most affected. As you can see, a lot of them are out of reach. They cannot be um, accessed through access roads. They are not educated. They have not had any formal education. They are unemployed. They live on um, on, on, on child grant support as well as elderly grant support. Sometimes an elderly grant support can uh, feed a family of eight to 20 people per month. Sometimes you have two elderly people, sometimes one elderly person and no one works within these families. So the shaping of the legal framework in South Africa needs to come to a point whereby we say, um, we need to design we need to design licensing regimes that would be inclusive for these families um, we need to design development standards that will include the communities that will be suited for their situations they need to be engaged formally um, meaningfully as i've already said And thank you so much for the opportunity to present on this platform.
Thank you so much for sharing um, your experiences. And, and I see a lot of, um, there's a lot of similarities between what is going on in Mexico because also ours was via strategic litigation. And so it comes as an imposition. It doesn't come because of a political will that actually is pushing forward these changes. Um, and as you say, you know, when we, oftentimes when externally they're thinking about regulatory models, they're thinking about tracking systems and how to ensure quality standards, which is important, but we would need to get electricity out to these communities so that they could actually form part of a tracking system. We would need to ensure that basic infrastructure is provided. Uh, and we have the same issue in, in many communities here in Mexico who have traditionally and historically um, uh, cultivated cannabis and poppy. And also the, the point about aerial spraying, I think is very important because that not only kills the currently illegal crops, but it also um, kills any other sort of crop that those, um, that those communities are growing oftentimes to eat and to be able to consume. Um, thank you very much. Um, now we, can, we will move on to our next speaker, Duncan, who is the Senior Strategic Advisor at Oxfam, Great Britain, and a Professor in Practice in International Development at the London School of Economics. And he had a very interesting uh, Twitter survey that hopefully we'll be able to uh, address a little bit in this. So you have the floor, Duncan. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Zara, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm supposed to talk about the drugs and development angle, but actually, I don't think I can add much to what Helen and Filisande and Zara have said. And I'm probably the person on this webinar, including all the people attending it, who knows least about drug policy. What I do do is watch conversations and uh, ideas rise and fall within the aid and development sector. And I'm really interested in this combination where you, have, you appear to have a mix of progress at a national level and real inertia in most of the development sector. Helen Clark is an exception. There are very few conversations. I can't think of a single conversation in Oxfam that I've been in about this issue. So clearly there are some massive blind spots and taboos. So the danger is that in a webinar like this, we all agree violently with each other and then go out and tell everybody, this is what you should be doing. And they go, yeah, fine. And nothing changes. So why doesn't change happen? Why isn't the aid sector getting more interested and more involved in this. Um, and it reminds me a bit of a different topic, migration. So on migration, you have a bunch of think tanks and economists who are saying, how can you be so stupid? Migration is great for everybody. It's great for the people who migrate. It's great for the, the, the economies who receive the migrants. We've done all the numbers. We've got the evidence. Why won't you listen? And it's a bit like that. So it's a similar sort of block to now, actually, I don't think the problem is lack of evidence. And I think just proving you're right again is probably not the best way to bring about change. So the, the, I'm sorry, as you've just done a whole journal proving that you're right again, but um, uh, that, that's my fear. So, so what could be stopping um, progress? What could be stopping organizations like Oxfam or international bodies picking up this issue? Um, I think one is, you know, narrative. So drugs, the, the, the way drugs is framed, illicit drugs are framed as othered or stigmatized the people you need to involve in finding solutions. So users, producers, traders, um, and aid agencies are maybe worried about being tarnished by association, either looking like they're sort of supporting crime or, or they're um, uh, naive or hippies or whatever. I think there are some, some real questions about the narrative, which maybe put international NGOs who want to be taken seriously and look really sensible, maybe puts them off. Maybe that's a possibility. Um, maybe it's just that the standard levers for action, which aid agencies and the people they lobby can take, are very, are very, are not always there. They're weak or non-existent. So one of the interesting things about this is there's an overlap between the focus on borderlands in talking about drugs and the focus on fragile states, which is one of the big issues in aid and development more generally. So aid and development sector is, is really worried about places where the state doesn't function because that's basically their main tool is to get the state to deliver services, you know, uh, um, run the law, have an effective set of institutions. And when you get places like Somalia or large parts of the Congo where that doesn't work, they're really struggling to find alternatives. 
And there's a, a, an interesting kind of echo there where, where it's actually a really difficult place to get solutions that, that, that fit with the way that the aid sector, development sector work. Um, the aid sector allows win-wins, and I think there's lots of genuine trade-offs in, in, in this topic, which are painful. So, you know, um, I'm, you know, I work on Myanmar quite a lot, and there you can see the rise in drug use in Myanmar has become a real issue. It used to be a nice, simple thing that, you know, peasants in Peru or Bolivia would grow drugs and Americans would take them. And it's not that simple anymore. So those, those difficulties and trade-offs, I think, make it difficult. Um, $500 billion a year creates a lot of incentives. It creates uh, a powerful institution that wants to keep things the way they are. You know, that, that enormous, the, the enormous value of that, of, the, of illicitness to some people builds a constituency against change. Um, so I just, so, so I think Zara mentioned, I just put a little poll out on Twitter yesterday and got about 200 replies, totally unscientific. You know, I would mark it really low if anyone did send this to me at the LSE. But um, it was quite interesting because way, way the biggest factor that 200 people and they're just basically aid, aid wonks, you know, development aid wonks, researchers, academics, NGOs. Of the 200, two thirds said it's reputational risk. Right now, and then 15% said it's not important enough to us, and 15% said we don't know what to do. So in terms of you as a lobby group who are trying to get the aid sector interested, I think it'd be worth starting from there and saying, okay, let's unpack that. What is this reputational risk that people are looking at? Is it that you can't get money for this? One of the replies on, on Twitter was, I can't see Gates ever funding this, right? I'm, I'm not sure about that, but that's what they said. So is it about the funding? Is it about um, the legal issues uh, around counterterrorism legislation and people really worried about license to operate? Is it about the, that self-image of not looking serious? Um, you know, it's, it's worth thinking what, what unpacking that issue of reputational risk. Um, the other things, it's not important enough and don't know what to do are kind of easier from, from in terms of where you're at because you've kind of got answers to that. But I think the reputational risk is a really tough one to crack. crack. Finally, Zara, if I've got time for another minute or two, yeah. Um, so I was just thinking what to do, right? So um, uh, I think first is really understanding the obstacles. It's proving you're right is a really rubbish advocacy strategy, often. Understanding the obstacles and how to shift them, who might be the right person to have that conversation, what experience, what narrative might shift those obstacles is often better than just proving you're right again. Um, so that's one. Finding the champions, I think. I've got my eyes on one, you may not have heard of it, but it's called the Center for Global Development. And they're really quite a centrist think tank um, based largely in Washington, who are just brilliant at getting the aid and development sector to pick up issues like cash transfers and migration and patent rights, and patents on medicines and this kind of thing. So I'm gonna write something about why they should adopt this issue. It's right up their street. Um, Breaking the link with counterterrorism, everybody's kind of terrified of, of, of going in a whole lot of these directions and, and, and somehow um, that needs to be broken. There's a, it's quite interesting, the fetishism around drugs. So, you know, I was just looking at the numbers, um, 750,000 people dying from illicit drugs versus 8 million dying from tobacco and 3 million dying from alcohol every year one and a half million from road traffic. You know, why is drugs so different? I mean, the, the de-fetishizing drugs would be kind of interesting. That, that seems to be happening with a lot of this nat national legislation. I'm a big fan of looking at success, something which the, the jargon is positive deviance. So if you can find examples of communities or countries, either historically or currently, who've made it work, who've got out of some of the worst effects of this, and learn from them rather than just doing these big sort of broad, broad, broad statements about, about drugs. And then keep fighting on process on the inclusion of, pe of the people who need to be in the room because they're often excluded. None of these are silver bullets, you'll be pleased to hear, but I'm, I, it's, I'm sure if we come back in 10 years time, something will have changed, something quite significant will have changed. 
but boy is it slow I, you know the first post i had on my blog from poverty to power on this was 2013 and it was saying drugs really important issue why is it taboo and we're having the same conversation now so hopefully for the next 10 years will be better than that thank you so much duncan i i found the the little poll very interesting and i think we would need to do a much larger one it would be very interesting to begin to unpack reputational risk what that even means um and i i noticed one comment on that poll that said don't the developed countries need to legalize or regulate first and then we can talk about the other countries and i Ooh, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, if anything, here in Mexico, we're trying to figure out how we can take advantage of the fact that uh, the United States, our closest neighbors, have not yet regulated on a federal level, and how do we consolidate um, our our criteria and 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 our social justice focused um, regulation before they enter the arena? So I think you've brought up excellent points, and I, I look forward to us working together to to see how we can really begin to. To, to, yeah, to understand these, to change the narrative and to bring on these, these new champions. And obviously the Global Commission has been one of those champions, but they've been very much in the drug policy world. And so now we need these champions that are from the development sector. So we're very happy to have you here with us today. So next up, we're gonna hear from Ann Fordham, who's the director of the International Drug Policy uh, Consortium. And she's gonna be introducing the newly launched uh, legal regulation framework for cannabis, which is some principles that uh, we've been working on as a network for, for a year and some. So thank you, Anne, you have the floor. Sorry. I think you're muted, right? I needed to take myself off mute. Um, hi, everyone, and, and thank you to Zara for the, um, yeah, for the excellent sharing so far in the intro. Um, it's been a really great conversation to be part of. I'm really delighted that, um, yeah, we're having this webinar today and we've managed to work together as a group on these series. Um, it's really exciting. And I do wanna give a special thanks to our colleagues at Health Poverty Action in really driving um, this agenda forward and working with us in the drug policy reform community to engage and reach out to the development sector. Um, it is critical that we're having these conversations and that these two disciplines are coming together more and more. Um, I would, I do want to just react quickly to Duncan because I do think in general there has been a positive trend. I'm much less pessimistic about the last um, 10 years because I've lived it um, in terms of trying to engage more actors from the development community and you know we have definitely made progress. I agree that it is slow but drug policy reform is um, not for the faint-hearted and you know you really do need to chip away at it but we've achieved a lot and you know we as Zara pointed out at the beginning you know we brought UNDP to the table in the last 10 years you know Christian Aid is here SOAS is doing a lot of work on this issue now with their big project um, we see parallels as well in terms of engaging the human rights um, sector over the last decade as well and I think huge progress has been made there also so i do think you know there's a lot of progress to build on as we move forward to what's possible in the next 10 years um, and the reality is that change is happening um, on the ground in terms of drug policies um, which i'm going to talk about obviously and the relevance of our principles and to some extent we're already playing catch up um, I think as a, has already clear from the excellent previous speakers, we're at a very exciting juncture in drug policy reform. We are moving beyond the focus that we've had, which has been very important, on the strong critique of the failure of prohibition, prohibition towards solutions of how to better manage the market through legal regulation and to address some of the serious harms that have been driven by policies that have been narrowly focused on eradicating the drug trade. And it's also important for the development sector to note that these harms have disproportionately been borne by people who are marginalized and in situations of vulnerability. Um, and in reforming these harmful policies, we must, sure, we must ensure that solutions do not further exacerbate inequality, poverty and exclusion. So it's also, I think, and that's the context of, of you know, our principles, important to note that legal regulation in, in and of itself will not be a silver bullet, and it presents some really urgent challenges. 
um, as we heard at the very start of the webinar from Helen Clark, we're seeing private investors and corporations rushing in to occupy the newly created legal markets, while the communities that have traditionally cultivated cannabis are being excluded from participation. In countries where legal markets are created mainly for export, small producers are barred from accessing international trade due to technical, legal and financial barriers, while Global North investors end up owning most of the market. And this is happening even in countries that aim to incentivize the participation of small farmers and traditional growers like in Colombia and Jamaica. And has already been said, there's a real risk that legal regulation might be more effective than prohibition in ending the livelihoods of traditional growers and further exacerbating and entrenching inequality and poverty, especially if the design and development of these initiatives are left solely in the hands of private interests. So it's really never been more urgent for development organizations to engage in drug policy and for drug policy organizations to engage in issues of social justice and international solidarity. It is to address these critical questions of ensuring social justice and reparations and redress for the war on drugs that is one of the key entry points for IDPC's work on legal regulation. So I am very excited that we're using this moment to launch the first edition of the IDPC principles for the responsible legal regulation of cannabis. With these principles, we aim to offer a comprehensive vision of how legal regulation can be used to advance social justice, equity, sustainable, development and human rights. As a global network, IDPC members live and work in all regions of the world and in diverse social and political contexts. In some of them, like Canada, governments have legally regulated cannabis for non-medical use. And although there are challenges in Canada, the political debate is more open to discussing drug policy reform. But some of our other members live in countries like Indonesia or the Philippines, where people who use drugs are systematically dehumanized and advocating for basic rights-based policies comes at great personal risk. Because of this diversity in the situation of our members in the past, um, we as the Secretariat had been reluctant to kind of encourage the global network to take a strong position on the legal regulation of drugs. However, and this is why things are changing, I think, overall. The context is changing for all of us. Our members have increasingly been calling for greater attention to this issue, especially from a social justice and human rights perspective. You know, the landscape, you know, as we've talked about before, is, is changing. In recent years, over 50 countries have moved to legally regulate cannabis for either medical or non-medical use. And some of our members report finding more receptive audiences when they argue for regulation than, than, than when they've advocated for harm reduction or for the decriminalization of drug use. So legal regulation is now a political reality. It's happening. And as the drug policy and, and the drug policy and international development communities need to address it. Cannabis is particularly relevant to a development discussion as it's a classic example of the colonial origins, the abysmal failure and the harms brought about by the international drug control regime. For the last 50 years, cannabis has been scheduled as one of the most dangerous substances in the world with little therapeutic value in spite of its rich history of cultural, ceremonial, medicinal and religious use. The officials that drafted the 1961 UN Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, mostly from North America and Europe, um, placed cannabis in the most restrictive schedule and by doing so outlawed the traditions and livelihood opportunities of communities in Asia, Africa and Latin America. Cannabis is still the most widely used drug in the world with over 190 million users and this exemplifies the futility of the prohibition based approaches, not only to drug use, but to the cultivation and production of drugs. Although these policies have been ineffective in eradicating drug markets, they've been extremely harmful in um, how they've affected communities of growers. So one example is in Morocco in 2017, there were 48,000 traditional growers facing arrest warrants for cultivating cannabis, which is a central you know, survival, livelihood for so many of them. 
Um, so in this context, the current momentum for the legal regulation of cannabis presents a unique opportunity for the development and drug policy movements to push for recognition of traditional uses, as well as policies that ensure the livelihoods of cultivating communities and to provide redress for the harms they suffered under the war on drugs. The 20 IDPC principles, um, which is literally just hot off the press, like less than an hour ago for the responsible regulation of cannabis are a point of entry into this debate. They explore the full implications of legal regulation to offer a bold vision of how it can help to advance social justice, equity and human rights globally. We have organized these 20 principles under six headings, the health and human rights of people who use drugs, social justice, inclusive and equitable trade, legal responses to activities outside of the legal market, gender sensitive approaches and monitoring and learning. I'm not going to go through all 20, but I just want to highlight five principles that are most relevant for our discussion today. First, to put in place strong affirmative action measures that guarantee the participation of traditional growers and small producers in the new markets. These include financial and technical support, lower regulatory barriers to access and preferential access to the market. Second, to create the space for the emergence of alternative business models and certifying schemes that distribute power and promote fair and sustainable practices through global supply chains. Third, recognize the value of traditional, cultural, medical and religious uses of cannabis and create their, the conditions for their preservation. Fourth, address the challenges deriving from the global prohibition of cannabis for non-medical and non-scientific uses. Under the current system, the international trade on cannabis for non-medical use is banned. This means that growers from the global south are barred from accessing legal markets for adult non-medical use of cannabis and are pushed to continue to source the illegal market. Last but not least, we must decriminalize all activities related to the personal use of any drug, as well as low level production and trafficking offenses. As I said before, communities that have traditionally cultivated and used cannabis are frequently excluded from the legal markets and they should not be punished for that. Um, I would like to point out just in closing that although our new principles concern, concern specifically the regulation of cannabis, this is because of the currency and the urgency of the cannabis discussion and because of the fact that this was very much a member led process in developing these principles. However, cannabis is not an exception amongst other drugs and should not be treated exceptionally. The principles that we propose today and the underlying values of social justice, equity, human rights, should and can be extended to the legal regulation of other drugs. And as new initiatives, research and regulative experiences emerge, we will be looking to expand them and make them longer and more comprehensive. So I really welcome you to read, share, advocate for these freshly launched principles. We hope that they'll be taken up by colleagues in the development sector, in drug policy reform, and specifically those working on changing cannabis policy. Um, as Zara said at the beginning, this is a call to action to ensure that social justice is centred within the hard fought reform of drug policy that is legal regulation. So I really look forward to further discussion and debate today in the rest of the series and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And just want to remind you all right now to use the question and answer box at the bottom so that we can begin gathering questions. I know there's been a lot of comments in the chat box and that's great, um, but so that we can begin to, to kind of begin this dialogue. We're now going to have um, about a, uh, 30 minutes to be able to really uh, dig into this, all of us together. Um, so one of the other things, uh, and I'm just very excited that these principles are coming out now because it's been a long process and I think as a network it's very uh, powerful that this is, this is happening now. Um, so we're going to get started on the questions. I'm wondering if anyone who has spoken would like, has a response or some sort of uh, gut initial reaction to what some of the other speakers might have said or want to, want to respond to, to anything that was brought up or should I just start with my own questions? Would anyone like to? No? Okay. So, um, well, we have one question. We'll start with that one. And then if there aren't any more, then I'll, I'm definitely okay with coming up with all of them. Um, so from, from Vera in Brazil, thank you, Vera, for joining us today. Um, 
Veda, Brazil is nowadays a country without a face or better, it is a country with a terrible face. All the victories in the drug policy field is attacked as all other human rights. We are walking back steps. What is your advice for us civil society activists? And this is something that um, we have noted and, and Damon Barrett would probably be the scholar that has most closely tracked. When we have these gains in drug control, uh, whether that's crop eradication, uh, interdiction, uh, or the incarceration of people who use drugs and they're seen as victories, um, they are deeply based and rooted in human rights violations. How do we begin to shift that um, so that there is, so that we are changing how we might be measuring um, and, and what are some of the possibilities, if there's any advice for civil society, uh, that is what Veda had asked. I don't know if someone would like to take it. You can just raise your hand and then I'll know that that person's starting. Duncan, great. Yeah, um, a good, if depressing question, Vera. Thank you, Obriela. Um, just some thoughts on, yeah, I mean, many of us live in countries where things are going backwards. You're not, I mean, it's particularly bad in Brazil, but Britain's no, not great at the moment. And we're, we're having similar conversations, you know, in, in many countries. I think the first one is to think about this shows that just winning a victory in terms of laws or policies is not enough if you don't then give it substance in social norms, understandings, public education. So when you're in a time of winning, you have to win in a different way. I think a lot of advocacy people just think if you get the new law, then you've won. And this shows how fragile that kind of victory can be when the politics changes. Second is I think you had to understand the enemy. You know, I mean, I think you really, that even something as bad as the current Brazilian government is not a, not a monolith. You have to look for allies. You have to find ways of talking. So in, in, uh, equivalent in Britain at the moment is we've just lost our development ministry. And half the development sector are going, oh, it's terrible. Everything's bad. And the other half are saying, okay, so who do we talk to? How do we change our language? What can we protect till current times get better? So the third point I would say is that there will come better times. And so you're thinking about what can you defend and protect so that you have something there for when the pendulum comes back. Um, so it's taking the long view if you can. It's a bit of a luxury in some situations, but that's all I would say about that. So I see that we have another excellent question, which is on, I'm involved more from a criminal justice side of things. What can we do to complement the development work that will be ongoing as that's likely to move even more slowly than some of the criminal justice efforts that have gone? And this is interesting. I mean, this is for me why drug policy is fascinating because it is not about one thing. And, and when um, it is, it intersects with development, it intersects with human rights, it intersects with economics, it intersects with um, social justice, it intersects with agriculture. And so this is really something that has to be looked at very comprehensively. And as Duncan said, we kind of, we know the evidence has shown us what we need to do, but there are obstacles that keep us from getting there. And so one of the things that I, uh, scribbled last night as I was thinking about this is that this is not an ideological issue, really. It is more about how do we, how does the evidence that we have generated change enough minds or build political will to see those shifts? Um, so how do you see, how would any of you see uh, this need to incorporate social movements together as we push for drug policy reform. Who would like to take this one? Anne, please. Yeah, I think, I mean, it also relates to the, to the last point that Duncan made. And I think, you know, as we're thinking about, and, and it's very relevant to our conversation here today, you know, we none of this is happening in silos right and often you know even in the context of covid where we've seen governments start to enact criminal laws to um you know to 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 
ostensibly try and stop the spread of COVID and criminalize transmission, etc. You know, immediately I think we we see that the burden of that criminal punishment are going to fall on people who are marginalized, who are vulnerable, who are, you know, um, already subject to, to other types of, of, of um, marginalization by government policies. And I think that's where we need to kind of build solidarity with other social movements to say, you know, from a pro-rights perspective, what are the things that we need to resist here and build those linkages? Because, you know, if we're pro-rights and we're wanting to ensure that, you know, vulnerable and people who are marginalized are supported and not targeted by government policy, what are those policies that specifically end up targeting them, people of color, you know, from a racial justice perspective? I think it's important to, to see this in the, in the broadest context and also to reach out to other pro-rights movements and build that solidarity now. Um, I see that as an incredibly important. Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, I think it's, this is gonna, we, we're now getting lots of questions, so we're gonna have to choose questions. But um, for, for Fila, there's a question about initiatives to reach out to growers in rural areas and um, whether local governments uh, like the Eastern Cape or the national level, what is helping growers to organize and, and if there are groups that are that are able to to get engage to, to engage in that way. You're on. Thank you for that question, uh, Zara and Mom. Um, at the moment, yes, there are some uh, initiatives coming from uh, uh, from activist groups such as ourselves of Zimbabwe Farmer Support Network. And we are working such that we work together with government, local government, as well as traditional leadership, because it is very important to acknowledge traditional leaderships when interacting with communities um, in such areas, because they can carry the word of the communities as well as interact directly with government. So that is one of uh, the areas in which we are working in, in trying to uh, collaborate so that we can all speak in one voice on behalf of these communities and see who can actually do anything to change the situation because we feel like um, government on its own does not have a clear understanding of these communities unless they have the communities themselves and the communities sometimes can be represented by um, by um, certain groups, movements and uh, traditional leadership. So we are working on, um, on plans to maybe even formalize the, the communities such that they are represented in parliament, they are represented um, on government sectors to take things forward. Thank you, Fila. I think that this, you know, we're getting to these kind of beginning to think about these solutions and people are putting questions that are really connected to very specific contexts too. So I wanna bring up two contexts that I think are important and that have been asked in these questions. One is around Afghanistan. How could Afghanistan transition to a legal drugs economy to ensure that it is not left out of the conversation? And the second one is around um, coke legalizing or regulating coca leaf, coca plant, and whether that would be more difficult uh, than cannabis. Just to give a little bit of context, in Colombia, there was recent, just last week, a bill was proposed in the Senate um, to regulate coca uh, products and also up to cocaine. Granted, this, these are opposition uh, parties, but it's it's across parties. Um, they've joined the initiative, and so this is really one of the first initiatives in Colombia that is proposing um, regulation using cooperatives, for example, to grow um, the materia prima, the the plant, and then uh, the government would would actually create the products that would be available on the on the on the market. So I don't know if anyone would, could comment just on these on these two specific case studies, and then we'll keep going with some of the other questions we have. Duncan, we're all looking at you for Afghanistan. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think- wasn't, I wasn't lying when I said I know less about drug policy than anybody on the call, okay? So- yeah, I mean, it's okay. So yeah. I think obviously cocaine 
and coca plant is much more difficult than cannabis because of the stigma related to the use, related to the, um, to, to the whole cultivation. People have a very different idea of what people who use cocaine are like versus people who use cannabis. And so there is just greater obstacles of political will, I would say. Um, additionally, uh, there are fewer countries, you would need probably countries, and this would be our goal, is that Colombia could produce legally and that it wouldn't be, you know, cocaine that's created in a laboratory that's then sold in the UK, but rather that there would be this development relationship of where more of the gains are kept in the country. It's, it, it's also important to maybe mention that, for example, in Colombia, less than 2% of the revenues created within the cocaine market, the global cocaine market, stay in Colombia, even though they cultivate up to 90% of the cocaine that is exported to the rest of the world. So this is one of those things where then we start to talk about how do we, how do we shift? And, and I am not an expert in Afghanistan. I can speak a little bit about poppy cultivation generally, but I don't, Duncan, I see now you're ready to join. And really you could all unmic right now and we could have more yeah. of a, a, a bit of a dialogue if you're interested. So you're basically advocating something like fair trade cocaine, which is kind of an interesting idea, right? Of I mean, that, that's what we're talking about here. And, and it just, I don't know Colombia very well, but I, I've been to Bolivia quite a few times and clearly you've got actually something there, which I think a lot of cannabis producers don't have, which is a cultural resonance around the coca plant, which has actually made it quite easy for Evo Morales to legislate uh, and to regulate on coca. So I guess it's going to depend a lot on the position of different uh, uh, plants, principally, in national cultures, whether there's a nice space for a sort of legal regulation nationalism approach to that. But what that does in terms of the international system is anybody's guess, but at least it means you can get more progress at a national level. Yeah, in a way we need to kind of suspend, and we did, the, we did a large project on cocaine in, um, in Colombia, and if anyone wants to read, you can go to cocaregulada.com, um, and, and it's a prospective study. But what we, what we had to do to get experts to even engage in the conversation was, you have to suspend your understanding of the international drug control system and mm -hmm. pretend like this is possible. And let's think about the nuts and bolts of what's possible. And then we can deal with the international drug control because changing the minds of 193 member states is going to be very difficult. We need a few countries to really begin to take on uh, these shifts. In Mexico, one of the things around poppy cultivation that we've been proposing is because we, we cultivate poppy in a way that is different than legal poppy cultivation, which is poppy straw method. We do raw opium, which then turns, is transformed into heroin and exported to other countries. And so one of the things we've been um, researching and writing some papers about is what if we use that raw opium, if we regulated that raw opium and we used it to send to Canada, to send to countries that are open to harm reduction models and that folks who are currently injecting heroin, which is adulterated and substituted with fentanyl, if they were able to smoke opium, maybe they would still inject. They, you know, I'm not trying to change their habits, but they could have a choice of products. And we know that smoking opium is, has fewer harms than injecting any substance. And then folks in, in Mexico who are cultivating this opium could be part of the, they could get a fair wage from what's going on. Right now, fentanyl has greatly reduced their incomes. Um, and with Afghanistan, we would think about it the same way of their relationship. Afghanistan cultivates 92% of the heroin in the world, um, but, and Mexico cultivates like 6%, but we're still the main source for the United States. And so Afghanistan could think about it with Europe, if there were European countries that were open to that. Um, it, this, it, is the, it is a very difficult, we have to change, and one of the things we talk about is not just change, uh, not substitute crops, but substitute uses. And so how do we begin to think about that, especially with um, where, where folks have been cultivating these crops for, for decades and generations? Anne, did you wanna jump in there? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, and two points on, on what you've just said as well, which I think is important to, to highlight, you know, the, the international dimension is incredibly important, you know, as I raised in, 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 in my presentation just now, you know, the sort of colonial uh, 
legacy of the international drug control system, um, which has basically affected, you know, because um, initially the trade in these plants before they were internationally scheduled were, were predominantly based in, in the global south. And then obviously with, with the international drug control regime, that trade, well, it didn't end. It just moved from being in a legal space into an illegal space. And now the legal space is opening up again in this instance for cannabis. And, you know, because international trade in cannabis is not permitted for non-medical use, it means that the traditional growers in the global south of those countries that used to grow cannabis more in a legal space will now be kept out of the legal space as it reemerges again. So I do think we have to address that point from a, you know, from a social justice, a trade justice, a development justice perspective. Um, and then in Afghanistan, you know, I, I was on another webinar recently for the SOAS project where it was interesting because the researchers on Afghanistan talked about how, you know, they, they felt um, concern. They, they actually joked amongst themselves about how actually if um, opium were legally regulated in this current framework of, of corporate capture, none of those traditional farmers who currently have their livelihoods on, in opium on, on Afghanistan would be able to participate. It would just wipe out their livelihoods. And I think that's a really important you know, part of this discussion that, we're, that we want to have is, you know, although we're actually talking about legal regulation now in a way that we weren't talking about it, you know, five years ago even, that it's actually a, a still a distant possibility when it comes to some substances or, 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 or drugs, but it's genuinely a much more serious political reality than it ever was. We really have to think about this additional dimension of how it's going to look, who is going to design it, and whose interests is it going to serve. Yeah, and that's, that leads into a question that Nicolas put and that I'd like to have Fila answer about, you know, he, he asks about how do we really achieve regulation within these principles of fair trade, uh, development, inclusion, and social justice when we know that the neoliberal system is really about exploitation, monopolies, and accumulation of wealth. And, and this is something that probably a few years ago we would have said, we want regulation. And now we've really come to be, we want regulation, but only if it contains these social justice aspects. So Fila, what would be, um, what, what, would, what are you advocating for in South Africa that maybe incorporates some of these, some of these criteria that we're looking for? It is important to look at it on, uh, on that spectrum of firstly educating people, destigmatizing de um, cannabis so that it is well understood because even government who is now taking the center stage with uh, developing it. They're very excited about it, but it is um, a very a literally understood. Um, I feel like at some point the, the government needs to make initiatives whereby they educate themselves by learning from other um, spaces globally, but not to say that they copy and paste and, and think that what works for Canada could also work for South Africa, uh, but to actually look at the South African landscape and see how um, who actually cultivates and how it can, it can be um, spread around between all of these, uh, the collective cannabis industry, uh, because it's more than just the farmers. You've got people who want to go into business with it and it needs to be approached um, on an educational level um, involving uh, legal um, specialists, obviously, who can, who can point out what can work and what won't work. Um, education is key in terms of uh, educating even the users of cannabis and um, looking at how the, the communities can be empowered with the legal framework. For instance, the licensing regime is just never going to work for the South African community as it stands because it's too expensive and it is designed to, to, to empower those to the elite, um, the select few. And we need to take it back from uh, back there 
Some people do argue, do we even need licenses and permits to cultivate cannabis or hemp? And why can people not continue cultivating the way they have? So that's a question to be had and that's a discussion to be had. Some people feel it should be licensed and some feel it shouldn't be licensed. But um, the way that it is uh, modeled currently is indicating that it is not in any way trying to include the subsistence farmers and uh, the, the small scale farmers. Yeah, one of, the, one of the clauses that we have in the bill that's currently being debated here in Mexico is that 40% of the licenses for cultivation would go to communities that have had their crops eradicated. And, and obviously then we see our work and your work would be similar in this case of, well, then we need to go and identify and ensure that those communities have all the paperwork and process and what they need and, and infrastructure that this, the absence of the state over all of these years, particularly because it's important to understand that when folks are, are in illegal cultivation, they are pushed further and further away from basic services. Um, and, and they actually have to go into mountainous regions in order to cultivate. So it's important that, and, and I'm not sure that that clause is enough. I mean, we've been pushing for 80%, uh, but it's, it's one of those things that you, it's like you have to find how are the ways that we can restrict the neoliberal model while pushing, while, while bringing forward. So for us, it's not about a level playing field. It's about how do we give these folks a, a higher up place in order to participate in the legal market. Duncan, That's I see it. you interested. I see you interested. And I have a question also for you uh, from Martin Drury, um, where he talks about, you know, we're going back to your poll that you did. Would it be more effective to start being publicly critical, calling out development sector on their inaction and thus make it a reputational risk to not be involved. We, we sometimes try and do this with politicians to show them that there is votes that would be in favor of drug policy reform. So possibly, I don't know if this would work with the, with the development sector. Thanks, Martin, and hello. I haven't spoken to you for years. Um, I There's think lots of friendly names here in this. Yeah. Um, uh, well, how about a hybrid? So why don't you do think about a league table and you say, yeah, these are the NGOs that are stepping up on drugs and these are the NGOs that are not. And we've got this transparent way of judging whether people are actually taking this seriously or not. And then no one likes being at the bottom of a league table. So do it that way rather than just start attacking people randomly. Do it a bit more systematically. I think that might be useful, um, might be interesting. There are a couple of other things I was thinking about when people were talking, which is... Um, what examples have you got from other issues which have done what you're trying to do? I was thinking about the landmines ban or the arms trade treaty or other things where you've got movement in what seemed to be a really stuck international system. And then look at what the campaigners did or what the, you know, what the dynamics were of those shifts. And I think that, that small coalitions of the willing which then spread out is one of the things we saw in the arms trade treaty work. So maybe there's things you can pick up there or just have some interesting conversations across issues in terms of it is quite striking that you've got this progress at a national level and then quite a lot of paralysis and other bits of the system so that ought to be something that can shift yeah and, and, yeah and even thinking that. about the sex tra sex work or um the pro-choice movements because the thing that's hard about drugs is that it's controversial it's that uh you know people think landmines are bad because you step on them and, and you'll- Okay, but gay marriage, you know. Gay marriage, also an excellent, I mean, we have to, and it's, and it's we're getting forward into these, um, into topics that are then more rights-based. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's about human rights that have been recognized. Mexico and South Africa are the two jurisdictions where we've had large Supreme Court cases that have pushed this um, because they're recognizing rights. And within that, Tripti asks, and she was part of the, um, she was part of the, these conversations that we had at UNGAS too, you know, how do we change the narrative, including within the UN, that um, suppliers and people who work in the cultivation are irresponsible, greedy, or simply evil, whereas lots of advocacy happens around consumption and use. Um, so how do we begin to, to address that in this way? And there was another question I wanted to add into that, but if we want to, I don't know if somebody could, could add on that, like, yeah, and go for it. 
I think it's a really um, important question. And, you know, I feel like, of course, you know, reps, you know, people who use drugs have been incredibly harmed by, by drug policies um, as they stand. But in fact, you know, something that we've been increasingly working with other civil society colleagues to do is to um, talk about, you know, the affected populations of repressive drug policies and that it is people who use drugs, but it is also, you know, farmers of subsistence crops like cannabis, you know, growing for subsistence cannabis, coca, opium. Um, it is also low level actors in the, in, the, in the drug market who are involved mainly in the illicit drug trade out of economic necessity and, you know, how they're criminalized and punished subject to the death penalty. So I think, you know, we are, I mean, there is, there is work to do there. And I think what that question points to is also the success that we've had, um, particularly I think because of the HIV AIDS movement um, in really advocating for the rights of people who use drugs. There's still a long way to go on that, on that road and that battle. And I think absolutely like more work needs to be done to highlight the situation of other actors in the drug market and how drug policies have, have affected them and you know, undermined their basic human rights. And this is also ensuring that you know, when people are included in discussions, when there are speaking opportunities where people can speak about lived experience, it's ensuring that those voices are additionally heard as an affected population of, of punitive drug policies. Um, yeah, and this, this goes to the question I was looking for around that drugs are associated with violence. And so then how do we change our even understanding that, and this person, Disha, writes that even my friends don't accept it um, because they have this association. And so how do we begin to change that image that people might have around drugs or people who use drugs? I don't know if someone wants to, I mean, for us, it's always, it, it's about the person, not the substance. And so, you know, I can drink alcohol maybe, and I will become violent, but someone else drinks, drinks alcohol and they don't become violent. And so really, even if you have used any sort of substance, you are responsible uh, for your actions. This is a tough point. And there, there is, I think Fila wants to answer, but I know there is research on that the majority of drug use does not, is not related to, to violence directly. Fila, please. Indeed, that's, uh, that's the notion out there. Uh, drugs are always stigmatized. Hence, I feel uh, a lot needs to go into educating even the people who think they know a lot about it, who are really trying to get into it. Because it, it, it has this long history of being this bad thing, uh, being uh, related to certain types of races who, who use these drugs and who behave in a certain way. It's all the stigma that has been created over so many years. And now because we're in 2020 and everybody wants to develop and wants to explore these things because there's all of these industries that can come out of them. Um, it, it, it can't just be miraculously done that all of a sudden we are all on the same bandwagon. You've got the greedy, you've got the desperate, you've got everybody wanting to take part in it. But the, the, and the space is there for everybody to take part. Much as I also, um, the rest of the organization, we speak for, for, for farmers, for rural farmers. We do understand that um, it is more than just the rural farmers that use cannabis and that are interested in doing the very same as the farmers want to. Uh, but we are very sensitive about the farmers who have suffered um, for all this long while and, and, and suddenly not being engaged and not being acknowledged. All of a sudden, when it's um, all systems go, let's, um, let's develop an industry. You need to go right back to where, um, um, where it started and whoever has been incarcerated and who stigmatized and um, ill-treated around it and then pick it up from there as a conversation. Education is going to be key in it. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I know we're, we're going to need to wrap up and that's um, disappointing because we still have some very good questions. But the good news is, is that we are going to be doing these webinars every two weeks um, and there's eight of them. So I am sure that we're going to be coming back to many of these questions uh, that are brought up and the comments that were in the chat, which were great, you know, about taxation, about violence, just to just to bring a few of the questions and you can be thinking about your last one to two minute intervention that you will make. Um, to finish, 
we really do need, Javier Sagredo has been asking questions about how do we create wider networks of stakeholders. I mean, this is the goal of this, these webinars is really how do we bring in uh, new stakeholders. Uh, James talking about the CND and the need to create amendments. I mean, this has been an ongoing conversation for at least the last 15 years. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, Mame asking, Mom asking about uh, if IDPC and Transform would be willing to lend their expertise to organizations in the Global South. Obviously, I'm, I'm now saying, of course they will, and they have been. I mean, uh, they're very engaged, uh, and, and Transform always shares all of their, um, their documents and publications around uh, legalizing all drugs, including heroin. I mean, there are legal heroin models in Switzerland and many countries in Europe where it's medical heroin that's being given out to people who um, form part of programs. And so that's where we get to, if anything, the, the drugs, the substances that are more potent should be under state control. And those are the ones that should be in a regulatory model, uh, even though sometimes they're harder to address and to come close to. And so, Noah, I hope that we can continue to have this conversation because I understand this idea of a slippery slope, but then we have to be able to address um, we have to be able to address how we continue to build on uh, what we know. And obviously, yeah, we need to be bringing in greater numbers of communities. There were also some questions, and I think we'll be getting into these in some of the other webinars around per permissiveness versus enforcement and how do you balance that. Um, and, and we'll be able to talk to some folks who have worked in government uh, over the series of these webinars to be able to share some of their uh, thoughts on this. Um, we are hope, uh, will there be translation to Spanish? I'm going to let somebody from HPA uh, respond to that. Um, so so this, is, this is the beginning. This is just the beginning of the conversations that we want to be having. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you all take a minute or two to, to give closing statements. I'm going to go the other direction. So I'll be starting with Anne. Thanks so much, Zara. And I mean, really, as you said, I, I was just reflecting as you were wrapping up there that, you know, this is really, um, at least for me as, as IVPC, the first time that we're, you know, really fully engaging in a conversation about legal regulation in this way, coming at it from, as I said, a very strong social justice lens. I mean, to the question of, you know, um, supporting groups in the global south, I mean, these principles come out of those conversations and, in fact, were led by the network in Latin America um, in the first place, Zara, as you know well, but of course have been in strong consultation with colleagues in Asia and Africa to develop these principles, which are really, you know, it's not five people sitting in London. It's really been a huge effort and labor of love of so many people from across the IDPC network that we have to be grateful to. And I really hope that they will um, help to inform these discussions, you know, give us a framework for talking about legal regulation, ensuring that we keep in, you know, in foremost in our minds how legal regulation will, will solve and repair the harms that we've seen of repressive drug policies and that we are not simply just saying legal regulation at any cost but that you know there are strong caveats here um, as, as we move forward in, in, in drug policy reforms. So, so thank you so much. Thank you Anne. And now we'll go with Duncan. Oh, great. Oh, I've learned a lot um, starting from a low base. Um, the thing that's most struck me is that I remember in the 90s talking to people in uh, Bolivia and Peru saying, if this stuff's ever legalized, the small farmers are going to get screwed. And now you're saying <laughs> it's happening. Um, so that's kind of uh, interesting to see that finally, you know, start to become more real. Um, think about broadening the network. You've got a, a group of zealots, devotees, people who are really fired up and passionate about this issue, which is both a, uh, an asset and a liability in terms of broadening the network. So the asset is you've got piles of information, piles of energy, piles of enthusiasm. The liability is that you can come across as like they only care about this one thing and we have to care about all these other things. And so you can drive people away with, with your enthusiasm. So I think it's kind of interesting to think, how do you as a very powerful, tightly knit, group of thinkers influence people who actually it's just going to be on the margins of what they're thinking about um, and I was thinking one you have to see things through their eyes you have to accept that maybe this isn't the top issue for people and then see well in what situation would it be interesting to them 
And the other one is like, you know, what's, you don't have a slogan like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, something which captures something which may be simplistic and maybe offensive in terms of the deep context analysis that you love doing, but actually will mean you get out to a wider group. So you need a, you need a, you need a kind of entry level narrative as well as all this much more complex, interesting stuff, which you're going to be talking about for the next eight weeks. But thanks ever so much for letting me in. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, the hashtag for this was a world with drugs. So yeah, I'm not sure about that one. But yeah, we'll have to keep seeing. I mean, we've had lots. We, we've had lots. So <laughs> we're, we're happy to take slogans from anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you for being here today. Fila. Thank you. Thank you for that, Zara. And um, just adding on to what Duncan is saying there. Um, I think it, the, the most uh, painful part about being involved in all of this uh, type of discussion is realizing that the people who are most likely to influence the change, I'm talking government perhaps in, in, our, in, in our case in South Africa, um, are the most distant to the subject and to the core of it. And um, I think it would go a long way to have them even in spaces such as these. I was wondering the other day um, if, uh, if at all there is any effort from the IDCP to reach out to the various um, areas like um, in Africa and all these other places that have uh, similar problems with the illicit crops, supposedly illicit crops. And um, if there is any effort to, to, to rope them in and to sort of uh, bring the subject closer to them and to make them see it, uh, not from a fighting uh, standpoint, because um, organizations such as ourselves may come off as if we are really angry, we've been carrying this, um, uh, this anger for so long because of the injustices and all of this. So we might miss the mark in uh, trying to relate um, the importance of um, government being involved in, in, in creating change because, I mean, they are forever going on about poverty and, and all of these things and trying to eradicate poverty, spending millions of money that go missing everywhere um, instead of actually allowing people to create a space to alleviate that poverty for themselves because uh, in my imagination, in, in, in Ponderland, for instance, or for uh, uh, cannabis cultivators, um, they, they may not even need assistance from government or from anywhere else if they are able to just make the money for themselves the way that they see fit. I'm all for regulation and uh, all of these things that will make it such that it is done in, in, in a meaningful way. So i um, just putting it out there that perhaps we should make an effort to try and link up with all of these uh, little rooms to 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 make it happen yeah definitely and i know that in the chat we've been sharing uh, many resources from the transnational institute um, from idpc from uh, transform drug policy foundation and so feel free to go to any of our websites all of our work is in spanish primarily but um, I know that there's also folks who have been in the chat participating in Spanish, and there will be subtitles in these recordings once they're put up on social media. I just want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank our excellent panelists. I think we got a full range of, of thoughts. As Duncan says, no, there wasn't anyone against, but you know, these pro prohibitionists have had a, a space at the center of, of debates and, 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 and government policies for 100, 100 years. And so now it's really about how do we make sure that the evidence uh, is at the center. And as you, I think the, um, the, the takeaways that we have from this are going to help us to really strengthen our work. Really believe that this kick started uh, a vital and urgent conversation on why drug policy is a development issue. And I just wanna make sure that you all are aware that in our next seven webinars, we will be taking a deep dive into some of the issues that were presented in our chat today around development and how they intersect with legal regulation. Our next webinar is in two weeks on Wednesday, the 23rd of September, and it's gonna be on legal regulation and cultural, traditional and indigenous rights. So I hope that you will be able to spread the word to your colleagues and other folks in your networks and join us for the rest of this ongoing conversation. 
we need to stop ignoring that drug policy is a development issue and we need to and we look forward to exploring this in more depth in the next few months and so feel free to go to the website and and register and we are just really excited to to have this response from all of you and hopefully we can continue because this doesn't end in any way this is something that is ongoing and if you know folks who you think if you look at the webinar series and you say you know i know somebody who would be amazing to speak on this let us know too because we don't we don't have everyone in our on our radar and so i think it's important that you can also have the opportunity to say you know this is a person who might be able to speak to this experience that we are wanting to highlight um, so please feel free to get in touch with us so that we can continue having uh, this dialogue with that i just want to say thanks to all of you for being here to our panelists um, to Clemmy and Tess for being on the back end, making sure that everything ran smoothly, and we'll see you in two weeks. Have a great day.